<laughs> okay, we're ready. Okay, I'm ready to go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my little short talk on on the design of user studies. Thank you, Mashuda, for inviting me. And hello, everyone. I can't see you, but I'm sure you are there. Um, I, I'm going to discuss some aspects of user studies based on my own, exper uh, ex my own experience from running user studies uh, or since I was a PhD student um, up to now. Uh, so a bit of lessons learned. If you have questions, feel free to uh, interrupt me at any time. Um, one of the most important things in user studies is um, being able to um, estimate or determine uh, what the uh, cause and effect is. And uh, in, in order to do so, we need to know what is influencing um, the results. And uh, in this process, it's very important to th take into account different aspects of the uh, in the experimental design. And there's a lot of different aspects that can affect uh, the outcome of an experiment. And there's some of the things I will discuss today. Uh, I just would like to also mention a few reasons for why we are conducting user studies in the first place. I know you are reading a course on human computer interaction, advanced human computer interaction. And user studies are a key part of this process where you, uh, for example, need to um, develop new metrics and, um, and designs. It could be that um, you need to compare different algorithms, for example, which one is more efficient. Uh, my own field, which is working with um, computer graphics, we use uh, uh, knowledge of the human visual system and observer. And we take that into account in the development of algorithms and techniques. So, for example, we use uh, visual perception to design uh, uh, computer graphics algorithms. And um, it's therefore crucial to conduct user studies. Uh, it also can be used to enhance the user experience, which is important in human-computer interaction. Um, decide on the most promising method, for example, and also as a means of constructing new research questions. Uh, so there are some reasons for why we conduct user studies. Um, how do we conduct user studies? Uh, well, it's very important to have a thorough and uh, controlled experiment. And uh, if we have that, we can rely on the outcome of the experiment. And uh, this will give a more robust answer to the question that we're trying to answer. So we have a research question, uh, which, for example, could be um, if we can use visual perception, say, to uh, create a perceptually adaptive algorithm. And uh, in my case, an example could be which of two algorithms looks more like realistic human skin, in, for example, in, in skin rendering. Um, and um, it's another important aspect to think about is that uh, experiments are very costly. This is why experimental design is important, because taking users into account takes a lot of time from the experimenter and people taking part in the experiments as well. It um, can be quite hard to acquire participants to take part in experiments. Uh, we often rely on volunteers to take part. And uh, when we have participants that come to an experiment, we want to make sure that we get uh, the most out of it so that we are not doing the wrong thing and wasting their time and our time and, uh, and getting reliable data. And therefore, it's uh, important to run pilot studies before your actual real experiments starts. And uh, this can be done with a few people. And you would be surprised what you find in uh, pilot studies. Um, 
It could be, for example, that your instructions were not clear. Something that was obvious to yourself uh, could be quite hard to understand for someone. Or should I say <laughs> slightly? <laughs> uh, it could be quite hard to, for someone else to understand that is not, uh, has not been involved in the experimental design process. Um, it could be about testing the setup, making sure that uh, you can record what you want to, uh, and so on. So it's important to run pilot studies to identify problems and to revise your, for example, instructions or even the experiments and the, your variables and conditions that you have designed. So it's an iterative process running user studies. And uh, another important aspect is uh, the number of participants. Uh, I often get the question, like, how many participants should we have in our user study? And uh, it's hard to say a specific number. It really depends on the type of study that you're performing. In some cases, uh, you can have a lower number of people taking part, and maybe uh, these people can uh, be used in a repeated measure design, where you can test different conditions um, uh, several times. You can also have uh, statistical anal analysis tests that require you to have uh, many more participants. So it's hard to give a rough outline. Uh, it's depending what kind of study you're doing, but between a few people and up to 30 or even hundreds for thousands for, for if you're involved in medical trials, for example. Um, Another important aspect to consider is the, your experimental setup, that you document everything, because this will be important for later on when you are presenting your results to be able to reproduce an experiment and what conditions you run your experiment in. So record your setup, and that can be done, for example, just taking photographs, measuring things, uh, and other things that are important that you might um, not think about later, and it's hard to go back to the actual experiment. Maybe it involves filming a participant if you have their consent. Uh, it's also important to document well, the procedure somehow. Um, and another important aspect is um, ethical considerations. Uh, often uh, experiments involving human participants require that you have uh, ethical approval uh, from your maybe national the national board or a similar depending a little bit on what your study entails but it's worth looking into what is the what the rules are for your own university say and specifically for research projects involving human participants um, in general what I tell my students is to follow this procedure either way. So we always inform the students in advance about roughly what a user study will, uh, what it will involve. They are allowed to sign an informed consent that they understand uh, and that they can uh, opt out of the user study at any time, for example. It's also important that we um, store data uh, uh, that we don't link data from participants to uh, uh, our actual trials, so we store, so we make it anonymous basically, and we don't present any information about the users in um, official research findings. So this is uh, because people are protected under the Data Protection uh, Act. So those are some of the things to consider in the design. There's many different threats to the validity uh, of your study that can influence this cause and effect relationship um, in other ways than what you're trying to measure. And I would like to go through some of them. Uh, the first one is the appropriateness of the task that the user is performing. And this is something that you have to consider. For example, uh, if the task is maybe too easy or too complex, that it can result in different results than what you are, uh, that influencing it in different ways. Uh, it's also important to think about and test uh, if users uh, or participants will understand the task uh, that they are about to perform. Maybe you there's something specific you want to measure, 
and you end up with uh, participants that just do not understand what to do. So you cannot measure what you want. Uh, your results are also affected by uh, the willingness of the participants to take part, for example, their uh, ability to take part, and uh, social desirability. I've had uh, groups of people before that just really want to do the right thing, or they're trying to guess what the experiment is about. That has uh, led to some interesting uh, results. Uh, people can also learn. Uh, so if you are running experiments over time, this can have an effect. Uh, so learning effects are uh, can affect, for example, people might mature. Uh, and one example that's normally given is in children's reading ability. Uh, so you can change over time. If you have a repeated task, maybe you're learning what the task is about. Uh, or I've had examples where people hear about the experiments from others. So in a condition where you're supposed to, say, free view a stimuli and perform a task in another group, I've had a person sitting down and saying, oh, there's five of those, and they've heard about, uh, they were in the free viewing condition, but they heard someone else talk about the experiment. So it's important to keep the experiment controlled, and uh, the participant should be unaware, or they should be assigned to the condition that they're in without affecting. Uh, yeah, so in this case, it can be quite an interesting result. Uh, there can also be a bias due to, for example, culture, which is important to take into account. Uh, the, the groups and who is in, in which group. It could be age differences, gender differences, differences in the experience of users. Sometimes it has been shown in, uh, in computer graphics before that maybe, say, more experienced users working with computer graphics are better at detecting certain um, qualities in relation to, well, uh, certain aspects in relation to, for example, rendering quality, or that the experienced gamers are better at judging certain things in, in, in game development than, for example, naive users that do not rarely play games. So this is important to take into account. Uh, Gender, it could be that there are, like, there are differences between female and male uh, users. So in, if one group contains only maybe females and one contains uh, only males, uh, you, you can test for differences between gender as well if you have an appropriate setup. Age is important as well because uh, over time, especially if we're working with studies in relation to visual perception, the human vision, uh, degrades and um, it's uh, it's an aspect which is important to take into account. Uh, other things that can affect are if you change the instrumentation measurement wise in your setup making sure that it's consistent. Uh, also the, the measuring behavior might change. As an experimenter uh, you might get better at uh, running the experiment if you, if, when you're performing it. And that's a, and, and also something to take into account, that you know what you're going to measure and how and when. Also, the fact that you as a participant are in an experiment can change your behavior in itself. So the idea of like being in an experiment can influence uh, the experiment. And we've seen this before as well. Uh, especially, for example, working with eye tracking as I do. Uh, eye tracking is a technique for capturing someone's eye movements, uh, for example, on a computer screen at any given point in time. And if it's important to have this in a controlled environment because anything that I see will affect what I look at, but also anything around me, like noises, other people coming in, people walking past, of course will influence where I'm looking. So a control setup is important and uh, this can influence the behavior, uh, being in an experiment. Uh, another aspect is uh, dropouts, making sure if you're repeating experiments over time that you have the same people taking part, or if you're taking new people, how are they different from the ones that you had before? 
um, time event changes are also uh, an aspect. Uh, what can we do then to mitigate some of these problems? Uh, first of all, what is should be done in a study uh, involving any human observer with testing visual perception, testing the vision, for example, the visual acuity or our ability to resolve fine details, checking for stereo vision can be important if people have an, any other eye deficiency, for example, if they're colorblind, anything that can affect the results. Uh, it's also a good idea to have written task instructions. So I was mentioning that the experimenter can introduce a, a bias by behaving differently, and maybe telling people different instruction if you don't remember which procedure you're supposed to go through. So by allowing the participants to have written instructions, you ensure that everyone reads the same thing. You cannot ensure maybe that everyone understands the same thing, but you can try and confirm that uh, as well by letting them ask in questions. Uh, but sometimes as well that can affect because the answer different, so you should be a bit careful. <laughs> uh, we can also, um, to avoid learning effects, we can randomize the order the trials are shown. And we can use uh, counterbalancing, which is a way of uh, um, altering the order things are shown. So if I want to compare um, a high quality and a low quality picture, I will show maybe a high quality and a low quality picture, but I will also show a low quality and a high quality picture in that order, in case someone would tend to choose always the first one or something like that in a, in a series of trials. So we can randomize it and we can use counterbalancing as well. And that can be done also with gender and age and experience and so, and so on, when we assign people to different conditions in an experiment. Um, it's also important if you're running long experiments to include, for example, breaks, things that can affect uh, the participant taking part in a long experiment, they might get tired or bored and their performance will degrade over time. So if you're running a long experiment, it can be wise to break it up into shorter sessions, for example. Uh, it's also important to have some techniques to deal with, like garbage answers, outliers. Uh, for example, in eye tracking, people that eye tracking didn't work properly, the calibration might have been off. So we need to have a way of dealing with that kind of data and not just take all the data that we get for, for granted. That is good. And if we also I have another example where it's important to let the participants practice or train before the actual experiment, the real experiment starts. And uh, if we want to, for example, compare novel interaction techniques and we want to compare mouse and keyboard or interaction with eye tracking interaction where we control the computer with our eyes we have to take into account that we are used to using mouse and keyboard but we might not be used to using uh, eye tracking as an input device so this is just an example where we can actually compare uh, the two in a more fair manner if we let the user practice with, with, with both, performing the task with both uh, in an ideal world as well, uh, to avoid any bias, it could be worth to have a double-blind technique where the experiment and experimenter and participants are allocated uh, randomly. Uh, and the final things that I want to mention is that when you present your user study in a scientific, in your case maybe a, a thesis or a scientific report, uh, we need to write down everything about the study, really. We, we need to describe the setup, which procedure we used, uh, information about the participants, anonymous, but uh, who took part, for example, number of males, females, what were the ages, what were the age, uh, etc. So this is why it's also important to document the setup in, in order for other people to, to run um, similar studies and compare their research to yours. Uh, I had one more slide on, for example, on how what eye tracking can add in addition to um, more traditional techniques used in human-computer interaction like questionnaires and think-aloud protocols. 
Uh, eye tracking can allow us to measure, for example, human performance and evaluate human interaction. It allows us to test for usability, for example, for um, how people look at web pages, different designs, how it affects uh, what you look at and the efficiency in finding, performing a specific task, for example. Uh, it also gives us a, an idea of cognitive processes and importance or visual attention, what we looked at, and let us understand task behavior in, an, in a different way that's hard to maybe judge from more traditional techniques. And it might also help explain individual differences. Okay, that was my, I think, 20 minutes. Uh, in my slides, it contains some further references to uh, some courses, a uh, course that we have um, had before at SIGGRAPH on uh, some of the aspects of um, running and designing use studies, and a couple of other references which are very relevant for you as well, I think. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to take them now. Anyone from the audience got any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, can you... Um, can you send? Um, with regards to um, significant numbers for a user study, what about incorporating like, a significant range? So would you, if, in your pilot studies, would you maybe concentrate on so, for example, our project's about trying to get um, further accessibility on applications. Um, what, would you say maybe concentrate on a certain range first or try and go broad and then concentrate as you go through the process of study of user studies? Well, did you have a specific study in mind? Um, well, there was one consideration for, because obviously with applications it's quite difficult for users who are blind to kind of be able to get around the application, so you'd have to consider like aspects like haptic feedback along that sort of line. So if you were to, would you maybe concentrate on designing the application prototype for them first, or would you go broad and then maybe start to go for the smaller, more niche market groups? Uh, do you mean if you design it straight away? Yeah. So would you go for the intended user and then so then try and, well, small pocket, use user studies for each group afterwards, or would you try and just make sure you had a good range in your first study? Well, it could be a good idea, I think, to involve the expected users in the design process, so that if there are certain conditions that you need to take into account already in the design of your algorithm and techniques, that you get it's sometimes quite difficult to uh, conduct the user study with a specific group. Maybe it's possible to do something similar with users that you have nearby. But it really depends on the type of study that you're trying to do and what it's about. Thank you very much. It, it can be hard to recruit um, people in specific target groups. So, for yeah. example, if you're looking at visually disabled people in particular, yeah. it can be actually hard to get reasonable numbers of people that are visually disabled to be able to infer anything useful. So that, that's so, what I was thinking, because if you were to go, if you were just a random sample, you're going to get obviously yeah. a large range, but you wouldn't get a significant amount of numbers from each group. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's maybe different uh, uh, conditions yeah. and disabilities. So it's, mm. uh, it's, yeah. very it's, it's complicated. Mm. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, come up. You can relay it if you want to. <laughs> can you come a bit further up here so that you can at least tell me because I can't quite hear you from there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hi, yeah. Um, I was just wondering what do you think is probably the best way to get feedback is just to release a prototype to the public, have some metrics and sort of like measure what the response is, and then you know carry on iterating over your prototype until you get it right. Um, I've seen before products have to appear more online, uh, so collecting the like the Some important aspect to think about then is um, that you, uh, for example, it depends what your study is. Uh, in in our case, if we're studying visual perception, uh, computer graphics algorithms, I mean, every person's setup will be different, and this can also affect your results. So. Uh, it's relevant for other studies as well. So you have to take into account that every user then have a different setup. So in some sense your experiment's becoming less controlled because you can't control for who takes part and what setup they have. So it could be to gather like results in mass and larger number of people, they might find more things quickly, but it, depending on your study it can cause also problems. If you have different lighting conditions, you might have yeah, you can't control the users. If you don't gather some demographic information as well, maybe. You can then maybe everything. Yeah, I, so I appreciate that, but I guess at the end of the day you're trying to release the product to them users anyway, so surely it's best to see how they use their product in their own environments. Yeah, yeah. It depends a little bit on what you're actually trying to measure. If you're trying to measure something specific about the application, then in that case a controlled um, user study would be valuable. Mm -hmm. If you're just trying to release something into the wild and see whether or not there's wide scale adoption, then it might be a completely different ball game. Right. Okay. So it just depends on what you're trying to actually evaluate. So I guess always the end result is you want to see how users who are going to use your products use it and they, they manage to use all the features, so surely. Yeah, um, but it's very hard to analyze how users are using your product if you don't have some control over the study design. If you just release something and mm -hmm. say, use it, how do you observe and learn from what they you know, from what they're doing. Sure. It's very, very hard to make tangible um, conclusions based on what, you know, what they might report. Yeah, but like you take something like a, an e-commerce website, the end result is how many people are buying stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, so you measure, yeah. measure that and then mm. if you're getting problems, yeah. then mm. you start getting some more details. Absolutely, it, absolutely. Yeah. So it's going to depend very much on the application. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, fair enough. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Any more questions from anyone? I think everyone's reasonably happy here now, but I actually have a question on their behalf, and that is, they don't know yet, but they actually have to design a questionnaire mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and a user study to evaluate the application concepts that they have to design. They're designing an application for going to a museum mm -hmm. and they're going to get the next part of their coursework today. Mm -hmm. So um, do you have any advice in terms of what to keep in mind when designing a study questionnaire for evaluating how useful an application might be to people going to a museum. Ah, uh, okay. Well, first, I think we want to gather a little bit of demographic data from uh, whoever is going to take part. So I would definitely ask about anything that's relevant for uh, the outcome of the product or application. So definitely ask for not not the name is relevant. So you want the age, um, maybe gender. Uh, are there relevant questions to the experience that can affect how you would evaluate this application? Uh, and then it depends on what the application is, I guess, uh, what you want to find out about it. Uh, there could be uh, that you have more like free text, uh, there could be that you want them to rate something. Uh, if they're interested, they can look into 
uh, something called uh, Likert scales uh, rating, um, which can be where where you make um, statements about something and you fill in if you agree or disagree. And you've probably done this in uh, maybe course evaluations before or something like that, and questionnaires yourself. Um, it can also be getting information, measuring something about the application. Um, yeah, so you really have to, I think, depend on the application as well. Uh, yeah. Have you got any advice for them on how to avoid asking leading questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's something that we see quite often. Uh, so you should avoid... It, it's... Yeah, you should avoid saying, isn't this product very cool? Uh, and then, you know, maybe people are more likely to say, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so, um, trying to have like a neutral, maybe statement or a question which is not leading either both negative and positive way is probably the best. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that, Veronica. Thank and, you. Um, uh, see you soon. Yes, see you. Bye. 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 Bye.